Hi friends, I'm Maureen Minivora and welcome to my channel. Today I was tagged by a friend on YouTube, Joss Jane, to talk about the perfumes that started my collection. How did this whole thing, being obsessed with perfumes, learning about perfumes, you know, being so sensitive and paying attention to, to smells in my life, how did it all came about? I didn't have much money when I was a kid and even though my mom was very artistically gifted gifted, and she to this day, you know, loves fashion, loves makeup, she does love perfume too, but she never really got quite as much into it as I did. The same with makeup or perfume. For her it was way less consumerist and I guess it's probably just a sign of our generation. Um, and way more about her expression of self. So we, we, we didn't come from, from wealth, so she would have probably one perfume and I don't really remember her perfume. So that was not really part of my story that I would, you know, smell my mom's perfumes and I would, you know, do, I probably did that, but I have absolutely no recollection, no kind of associations that are conscious to me. So my introduction to the world of beauty and to the world of perfume started quite plainly from gloss magazines from like Elle, Marie Claire, Vogue and Cosmopolitan and things like that. Actually much much less the highbrow one, highbrow ones such as like ABCL or Vogue or whatever and much more kind of like accessible and like for the young girls time of magazines. I, th I remember Mary Claire, I remember Elle a little bit, but it was mostly cosmopolitan and glamour, I think. So this is where I learned about all the brand names, to, to be honest. Uh, they, I really didn't pay attention to the stores and to the things, mainly because I didn't have money to spend, so I didn't even indulge in window shopping. But the magazines, those are the pieces of luxury, like imaginary luxury that were really available. And I remember just devouring those from like cover to cover. So at that some point, the very first name brand perfume that I got it was a gift. It was a gift for my birthday and that was Burberry Weekend. Those peaches. The floral, peachy, like really sunny, really flamboyantly happy perfume. I still remember the bottle. I heard that it has been reformulated at least once since the time it was released. But ever since then, Burberry and the way, at least in the early 2000s, how, early millennium, how they approached the perfumes that kind of stayed with me as just a little factory base of everything that I compared to, I compared to Burberry. Uh, ever, like their newer creations, I actually don't really like any of these like Baccarat Rouge clones and things like that, like the Burberry hair and things like that, but I still have a very soft spot for the way they were blending perfumes. Uh, perfumers were doing that for the brand in the early 2000s. I no longer own Burberry, uh, Burberry Weekend, but uh, one of my favorites and what I call like the perfume for the first day at New Job <laughs> is Burberry Brit Rhythm. This is a very elegant, put together, simple, clean, uh, kind of lavender-ish. Like I wouldn't say this is like a solar floor, like it's not like the lavender is the only note here. But if you want me to kind of pull one note out of the whole bouquet, that would be a sophisticated, put together lavender. It's both soothing and invigorating. It's elegant, non-intrusive, yet, yet it is charming. So again, this is what I would probably want to smell like if I just came to like a new team, or was a new job where I wanted to kind of show a little bit of my personality, but still kind of create a very balanced, uh, first impression. So Burberry still is in my uh, collection even though I'm I'm patiently waiting for them to find their mojo again because I would love to love their perfumes again. The second brand that was very centric in my life back in the day was Escada. You know I'm gonna find it in each in the beginnings of the history for me because even even the, the names like Burberry and Escada, that was niche for me. That was like the top of the top of the top because I could barely afford anything at all. So the one that I'm going to show you today is Joyful. I didn't know about it then. It's it's fairly new edition. 
to my collection and it's very like refreshing flowing um, floral there's not it's not sweet it's not powdery it's not pressing you down this is something when you really want things just like you want to fly away basically beautiful easy to wear very summery uh, back in the day I still remember uh, Escada had this line of uh, solid floors so like one one flower that, that that the perfume is, the fragrance is dedicated to. And the one that I had at the time was Lily. I think it was a light green bottle. I don't even know if it's possible to find any pictures of it right now. It was very zesty. It was very almost acidic. Those were all the vogue back in the day. And I absolutely love the Lily. When I bought that bottle, I don't remember how long it took me to even save that for it. And they gave me a little bit like a booklet, like a teeny tiny um, booklet that came with with uh, with the packaging where they had their new collection photographed. And I like I still remember those little floral dresses, and I like memorized them. I just co completely copied them to my memory because that was I to me it was like what what the richest people in the world would wear. Uh, talking about zesty and kind of very almost acidic, fresh, ozonic fragrances, it was all the rage back in the day, and I was that was my pr primary interest. Burberry Brit was a gift, and I liked it, but what I truly loved were, were those ozonic, almost bitter, super fresh and crisp kind of scents. And back in the day, the world was split into three types of girls when it came to aquatic or crisp fresh scents. It was a Kenzo girl, uh, because Kenzo had, I think they had like a number of perfumes, but I think Lo Parc Kenzo was the, the ozonic aquatic perfume of the times. And the third, the second type of girl was uh, Dolce Gabbana Light Blue girl. Again, I don't understand why like there were these almost like tribes like only Dolce Gabbana Light Blue, no Kenzo, thank you, no thank you, and vice versa. And the third type of girls, which I didn't really know about, I knew about Light Blue. A friend of mine used to wear it like, this was like signature scent of hers, so I didn't even dare to buy one for myself. So I was a Kenzo girl. I don't have anything by Kenzo anymore, but the third type of girl was Armand Bassin Red Girl. That was a very refreshing, almost spicy bergamot with ginger and I completely missed that part of the story of the narrative about the fresh ozonic fragrances so I decided to indulge in it uh, now. I fairly remember what La Pacquinzo was like, I fairly remember what La Blue Dolce Cabana was, at some point I owned each of them but I never owned Armand Bossi in red so I decided why not now. I got myself a limited edition bottle, it's the same juice, you, you can buy it fairly cheap. It's basically bergamot, lemons, fresh ginger. A very refreshing, it kind of opens up your lungs a little bit. It's not bitter or crisp like La Pac and Zo, uh, could be. This a little bit more aromatic in that way that the, you know like the, the spice in the ginger that it's both spicy but yet also soothing a little bit so yeah that's what Armand Bassi in red is for me so I'm very happy that I finally completed the whole circle now I know about the three cult favorites of that of that era of the early 2000s another one that was really um, a big favorite of mine was Miracle by Lancome Lancome was having a blast back in the day. I mean, they're still kind of controlling the narrative when it comes to um, mainstream perfumes still to, to that very day, like La Vie Belle alone, right? There is a whole chapter in perfumery for better and for worse. And Miracle was a very fresh, kind of zonic floral still remember that pink bottle. I can t contemplate it buying it again, but I, did, I decided since my taste changed a little bit toward more sweeter and darker side of the perfumery, I decided to sample uh, another cult favorite of theirs. Back in the day, I loved it on other people, but I just could not, I could not carry it myself. And this is Poem by Lancôme. It is still, I dare say, 
and very underrated gem in the kind of cheaper mainstream designer perfume shelves that smells like Raja perfumes, like Serge Off, like all of those top of the shelf niche luxurious brands. If you're looking for these kind of like royal, regal, sweet, smothering, floral, there's just, you know, like screams of luxury, but you don't want to pay the prices that, you know, Raja Dove would ask you for, and like a lot of those like very, very top of the shelf hyperlux perfume uh, houses, try Paran by Lancome. It's truly one spray is all you need for two days. So yeah, when it comes to Lancome, that was Miracle, and now I'm still exploring their 2000s classics. Now we can, with full potency, call them vintages, because it's been 20 years. The early 2000s now is all the rage because, you know, people who are of the age to buy perfumes, like me, we were brought up on what the 2000s were about. So this is quite a treat for me, like a very recent discovery. And another brand that I rediscovered only two years ago, which was all the rage in the, in the end of 90s, was Salvador Dali. At this point, you can call it a niche perfume house because they only make perfumes and they were never part of any mainstream. At least I didn't really see them in... I mean, you know what I mean? It's not like a Estee Lauder that makes everything, Lancome that makes everything. They were always making perfumes and very creative kind of perfumes. At least some of them were. And the one that I still have with me today, I repurchased it and I used up the whole bottle in the past, is a Salvador Dali Laguna. I still claim that this kind of salty, aromatic, it's like a Mediterranean breeze in a bottle. It makes me think of kind of like the the times that I spent on Black Sea, like the more like a desert part of it, where the grass grows so green and so tall and so quickly gets completely burned down by the middle of July by the sun, but it brings up all these really potent smells from the earth and from the dry grass. The, the smell of earth there in Crimea, it's, it's nothing that I've ever smelled before or after. So they, this is not it, but it kind of brings me closer to that memory. I still think this is a very cheap perfume that has incredibly imaginative packaging, what we unfortunately don't see much these days, um, and a niche smell, like a niche profile to it. Um, there's nothing that it comes close to it still. So if you really want to try something that looks cool, uh, doesn't cost a lot and has a unique, not for everyone, but really unique and cool type of olfactory profile, try Laguna by Salvador Dali. I, I was very pleased a couple of years ago to discover that they didn't, uh, they didn't, um, they didn't disappear, that they were still in business. And the one that is probably one of the, the crown gems from my past is Vivian Westwood Anglomania. I loved it. I lived in it. Back in the day, I, it was the punk. It was so loud, unapologetic. And only very recently, when I really delved deeper into niche, into the history of the perfumes, I realized that it's not really nearly as offensive or punk, you know, like it's not as provocative as I remembered it because this is a truly unique take on a powdery rose that is indeed loud. It's like a mono accord almost through through the longevity, the duration of, of the dry down. Anglomania is, it really walks a thin boundary of, of being soft and scandalous at the same time. Unfortunately, all Vivienne Westwood perfumes, as far as I know, that's gone out of business and it's very hard to find the old bottles. They used to use really good ingredients and like a lot of their perfumes since their publishing times acquired cult status, including Anglomania. I have only one more, this is an empty bottle. I have only one more bottle left and, and then I will be Anglomania less. I'll be an empty shell. Used to be my signature perfume. 
Uh, when I reacquainted myself with it about like four years ago, it again became my signature perfume. And uh, since then, there's not a single perfume, with one exception, that ever even came close to a signature status. I love a lot of perfumes, but I can no longer say that there's one that's, that's signature, that's like me in a bottle. It's not really the way I think anymore. But back in the day, that was it. Another one that I smelled once and completely just lost my marbles. The only perfume by Hermes that I saved up and bought back in the day and the only perfume that I hunted and hunted and tried to find and finally found secondhand. This is a very rare release. This is a flanker. This is Calash of Delicate. Delicate? If you want to say it in English? Uh, this is kind of like iridescent bottle with a very floral, light floral, floral typical for Hermes, non-sweet floral. Again, the way that they compose their colognes and kind of light their florals to me is a paragon of delicate restrained elegance and Kalesho Delica was for whatever reason back in the day when I first sniffed it I I said that's how my childhood smells it's some smell from my childhood and I couldn't figure out what that was was it some person was it an object was it a place I just knew that if it the Kalesh of Delica evoked something from me from from early childhood I still do not know what that was. I no longer have that reference in my mind to the childhood. Now I have reference to me being like 20 years old or so. Beautiful, just beautiful floral. And still, there is nothing in my olfactory library that is even remotely close to it. I wish Hermé played it kind of like, played it cool, you know, and maybe brought it back for this limited amount of time because now a bottle of Kalesh Eau de la Cate can easily cost $200. They are very hard to find and since it's a light floral, also beware if you decide to kind of look around, most of them have kind of uh, lost their top notes. It's very common with the zonic and kind of fresh fragrances, they are the least likely to survive the test of time. So the my, my bottle that I've I think I got it for $50 and was partially already worn, is already missing some of those top notes because I have a second bottle that was kept in pristine condition by the owner and that one smelled exactly how I remember it. This is the one I'm using right now and it's already a little bit less crisp, a little bit less flowy, but it's still, it still has the, the heart and the base that I so much admire. Uh, oddly enough, that was it with their mess for me back in the day. I adored and completely used up the bottle of Kalesha Delica. I wish I knew, you know, like back in the day, like I well, wish we knew which stocks to buy, which perfume bottles to get a double off, because if I knew back then what it would become for me now, I wouldn't probably gotten 10 bottles at the time, but that, that's just not realistic. It's fine. I'm happy that I have this one now, you know. This is good enough, I should be grateful. All right, a only perfume that came close to replace my signature scent, Anglomania by Vivian Westwood was a random blind discovery from Fragrance Net when I got myself a little tester. It was like a little vial. It was a boutique line by Cartier, and this is uh, Leur Defendu. I hope I'm saying it right. The seventh hour, it's easier for me to say, this number seven. Oh my God, there's something about these dark, dark chocolate patchouli with some gourmand notes enveloped together that is just makes me think of Hogwarts. It's like, it's like the, the Hogwarts after a magic feast. You're, you just had, it's just like you're living in this old English castle in the very warm, lit with a fireplace, basically, 
library if you wish after a beautiful dinner you're having a little bit of dark chocolate with coffee and even though you're sitting in the very warm room with the library and the old books and the leather chairs there's a little bit of that kind of wet stone feel to like a truly old stone castle that kind of that kind of like wet coldness that lurks in the dark corners this is truly magnificent perfume i've i've never been a big fan of patchouli i do like dark chocolate i couldn't find it anywhere the chocolate of nuclear doesn't even smell like chocolate to me to be honest but this is where i got truly dark chocolate with plus the old english castle and the a library and the well lit fireplace and me having their like a late dessert after a lavish dinner beautiful just beautiful that opened me to kind of start looking into boutique and like hyper luxe lines of well-known houses we we do know it's like a new trend uh Guerlain has um, it has its own kind of boutique line lancome has its own a kind of premium line of perfumes all of the houses are trying to now kind of have the mainstream perfumes that they kind of produce and in enormous kind of scary quantities but also kind of reintroduce the concept of perfume as an art with a corresponding price sticker so this for me was a sign that there is something there there's something there that i could truly love and i ever since i acquired Cartier seventh hour, I've been kind of moderately curious toward hyperlux perfumery. What truly opened me to collecting and exploring niche perfumes were two houses, both of which, by the way, I only managed to find and explore via Sephora. Again, a very mainstream channel of discovering something so unique and rare. Sephora at some point had a program where they were introducing a lot of truly amazing niche brands, both makeup and perfumery, and they had both of these great niche houses on their shelves. Now it's hard to believe that that was the case not so far ago. I got introduced to L'Artisan Parfumé and Etat Libre Etat Libre d'Orange, both through Sephora. In both of these scents, I acquired through Sephora. Well, these particular one, bottles, I, that's already replacements, I bought them elsewhere. But these two fragrances, I learned and bought in Sephora. Uh, Le Dambre Extreme, Extreme Amber by L'Artisan Parfumeur, which is a truly magnificent, dark, lavish, amber that is not spicy. This is the roundest of the, of the roundest of circles. This amber is so smooth, so caressing, so heavy. This is something, it's like a really heavy blanket that just almost pins you down. It, it's incredible. And again, I wish Sephora that made it possible for people who were never really into perfumes to really explore what high perfumer is all about, that they kind of stick to their guns a little bit longer before letting all of those niche brands, letting them go off their shelves and kind of like forget it. Because that's what started for thousands and thousands of people in love for the niche perfumes, but you can no longer buy them in Sephora, which is like such a shame. They did such a good job introducing those perfumes to a wider market and but i guess that's not how retail cycle works you know they didn't sell them in the due course of six months off you go but yet the long-lasting consequences at least for me they're still here so i still love l'artisan perfumer i love l'ambre um le d'ambre extreme extreme amber and that's what completely unlocked me my start of my, my love for the L'Artisan Parfumer and me starting to explore niche perfume houses alongside with Etat Libre de Range, like this. I am an ardent fan of Tilda Swinton. 
mainly because of her I heard of this perfume because it was associated with her name and it was just American Thanksgiving in a bottle and the beautiful um, poem that she reads in such immaculate soft voice please look it up I think it's available on um, White Cloud, Soft Cloud, this is a big platform where people, where music artists upload their creations. Ah, oh, this is the only perfume, a perfume that has pumpkin and doesn't smell like just aromatic essences that are put in like pumpkin lattes and, and candles and such and such. This is actually a perfume. This is a fragrance. It has ginger, it has pumpkin. It's, but it's not simplistic, it's not cliche by any means. I fell in love with like this back, like I think it was fall. And ever since I cannot imagine my fall without at least a few beautiful days that I spent so lately with like this by Top Liber Durange. Again, that whole brand, these two brands that's what Nietzsche truly became to me for a number of years after I got introduced to it by Sephora. But that was not it. Another way, when I started researching what Nietzsche perfume, perfume houses are, what are they about, the, I couldn't possibly not discover Serge Latans. I have very complicated relationship with the fragrances by that house. I consider them to be more paintings rather than personal perfumes for personal wear. Uh, yet, if you really want to learn about what perfumery is about and what it can do, um, you can really skip this house. Serge Lutens is, for many people, is what niche perfume houses ought to be. It's like the golden standard of niche perfumery. Um, this was the first perfume that I tried from this house that I actually really just, you know, on a very subjective consumerist kind of like simple way I could wear. You know, I can I can write essays about Serge Lutens perfumes, but it doesn't mean that I'll actually wear them. The Feminine de Bois was the first one. It's like, okay, finally, it's something I would actually wear and would enjoy wearing. This is juicy, sweet prunes, almost like bursting with juice when you're sitting, you know, like eating these like really fresh, juicy prunes sitting like somewhere on a wooden bench. So the woody notes and the juicy, almost jam-like prunes in Feminine de Bois are so alluring, so accessible in contrast to many other perfumes by this house that I finally found a like my center, like the place from which I could start and continue exploring Serge Lutens and other niche perfume houses, knowing that it doesn't have to be all cerebral, it doesn't have to be all some kind of like conscious appreciation of intellectual effort, that you can enjoy something um, sophisticated, niche, yada yada yada, but you can still have fun with it, you know, you can still enjoy it on a very basic human level. So Fumini Dubois is solidified my love and interest in niche perfumery. So yeah, so these are probably three essential houses in my life when it really got serious, when I really got serious about perfumes and collecting, if you wish. L'Artisan Parfumeur, Etat Libre d'Orange, and Serge Latins. And the last story for this video is going to be an American brand. American perfumes had their heyday, you know, like the glory day in the 80s when the bright, almost offensive, incredibly boisterous concoctions were created by Giorgio Beverly Hills, Estee Lauder and things like that. But ever since, uh, perfume houses were um, diverse, and this is good, but in the same fashion, American perfumery kind of no longer had a particular face, if you wish. It didn't, they didn't have a signature style, a signature thing. And I 
I guess celebrity perfumes, that's the invention, <laughs> not the reinvention, if you wish, a very well um, a profitable invention by American perfume houses. But I was struggling to find a truly America, like USA centric house that were making really interesting, inventive and beautiful perfumes. And this is the one that kind of like reinvigorated my interest in the native houses to the United States. And this is Elizabeth and James. They debuted in Sephora again. I mean, you can say good or bad things about Alta Sephora and all of those big department stores, but they truly are the ones who scale any idea or scale any trend. And this is the one that I fell in love head over heels. It was it made it big. This perfume by Elizabeth and James, which is called, is called Nirvana Bourbon, this is the one that every single beauty blogger showed that I know of in their videos at the time. Even people who didn't care about perfumes and love perfumes, they all at some point heard or smelled Nirvana Bourbon on themselves or in the store or on somebody else. To me, this is something to be proud of for sure. Like when I travel, I used to travel a lot, hopefully one day again, I would always bring this with me if I needed to talk about a like native, you know, native perfume house from the States that are worth the attention. Just try it. Um, the bourbon vanilla, like it has this boozy, flamboyant, a little bit kind of like mooey sand that moves a lot. It moves between uh, these kind of like alcohol infused vanilla toward oak, toward kind of woody nose, toward something even leathery. It's so delightfully it's like prohibition era in a bottle and it kind of looks that way, doesn't it? It gives me a little bit of these like Tom Ford vibes, but the packaging is impeccably stylish, beautiful and interesting. The profile itself, the blending here is unlike anything I smelled on the market. So yeah, Elizabeth and James, to me, it was a like golden star that the United States can produce incredible designer perfumes, affordable for everyone, sold everywhere, that still have a very recognizable and high quality make. But yeah, this is how my perfume collection started. I hope you found this video at least a little bit entertaining. Please let me know in the comments below if you did. And uh, what were the signature perfumes that started your interest in perfumes? How did you, by the way, how did you find my channel? <laughs> because these days I think Good people should stick together and I would love to hear about what was your path into, what sparked your curiosity, what sparked your interest, how, how did you get where you are here? I would love to hear your stories. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you had a chance to. If you like this video, please share it with your friends who, loves perfume, who love perfume as much as you and me do. And I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.